You've got troubles of one kind or another? Get thee to the coffee house. She can't make it to your place for whatever perfectly plausible reason to the coffee house. Your boots are torn to the coffee house. You make 400 and spend 500 coffee house. You're a frugal fellow and don't dare spend a penny on yourself coffee house. You're a push paper pusher and would have liked to become a doctor coffee house. You can't find a girlfriend up to snuff coffee house. You're virtually on the verge of suicide coffee house. You loathe and revile people and yet you can't live without them. Coffee house. No place else will let you pay on credit. Coffee house. Who is this guy, Altenberg? He is the epitome of the bohemian coffee house poet. Uh, he is the, the child of a, um, a, a prosperous Jewish family, turn of the century. Uh, the father's a businessman, a very enlightened businessman, desperately wants this son to come to something, to, to arrive at something. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our, our man here, uh, Peter Altenberg, has other ideas. He, uh, among the legends told about him, he flunked his, my son, my son should, who's here shouldn't be hearing this, he flunked his high school uh, uh, graduation exam called the, the Matura, uh, very much like the, the uh, uh, baccalaureate, because <laughs> legend has it, and Altenberg loved this story, in response to the question, the influence of the New World America, he wrote one word, potatoes. <laughs> so this didn't go off well with the uh, school administrators, but I think this was the beginning of this <clears throat> concise sense of literature. Uh, Altenberg, uh, his concerned father sends him to a psychiatrist, you know, Freud is happening at this time, to get diagnosed, why doesn't this kid want to work? And the, the, the psychiatrist gives him uh, his ticket to freedom by diagnosing over excitation of the nervous system and concluding incapacity for employment. <laughs> which is what, of course, what every writer desperately wants, which is a, a ticket to Bohemia for the rest of his life. <clears throat> At that point, uh, Altenberg says goodbye to uh, established bourgeois life, which, he, however, he mooches on for the rest of his life, because how else are you going to make it? <clears throat> and he uh, sits in cafes and is scribbling things. He is allegedly legend, has it discovered by, among others, Karl Kraus, Arthur Schnitzler, who want to know what is this odd-looking man with the hanging down whiskers, what is he writing? They get these texts first to a newspaper, then to, I think it's S. Fischer Verlag. He becomes a, a, a celebrity almost on the spot with his first book. Thomas Mann is wild about this guy. Robert Musil is wild about this guy. Kafka is wild about this guy. I'm going to read you uh, the retrospective introduction to his book, Mash and des Lebens, The Fairy Tale of Life. <coughs> We relegated fairy tales to the realm of childhood, that exceptional, wondrous, stirring, remarkable time of life. But why rig out childhood with it when childhood is already sufficiently romantic and fairy tale like in and of itself? The disenchanted adult had best seek out the fairy tale like elements, the romanticism of each day and of each hour right here and now in the hard, stern, cold fundament of life. Even the truly predestined poets, with their sort of fire out there? No. <laughs> Even the truly predestined poets, with their more impressionable hearts, this is dramatic, this is, I love this, <clears throat> eyes and ears fetch their telling tidbits from actual occurrences, listening in on the romance of life itself. 
The rest of us can all become poets too, if only we take pains not to let slip a single pearl which life in its rich bounty tosses up every now and then onto the flat, dreary beachhead of our day. Everything is remarkable if our perceptions of it are remarkable. And every little local incident written up in the daily newspaper can sound the depths of life, revealing all the tragic and the comic, the same as Shakespeare's tragedies. We all do life an injustice in surrendering poetry as the exclusive province of the poet's heart. Since every one of us has the capacity to mine the poetic in the quarry of the mundane, the poet's heart will forfeit this privilege through the evolution of the intrinsic culture of the common human heart. His theme is Vienna, this place that is teeming. <coughs> All of the immigrant groups from the entire Austrian Empire, if they want to make it, very much like New York, you want to make it, you come to Vienna. Vienna is the place that's happening with all the problems of a place that ha is happening. It's exciting, it's seedy, it's corrupt, it's, uh, uh, there's intrigue, there's politics, there's poetry. This is a piece called Flower Alley. I think I have to put the hat on for this. <laughs> 6 a.m. It is dry, cool, the sky is a warm white blue. Bleu lacté, the French writers would say. A florist dealing in artificial flowers flings back gray wooden shutters open for business. In the dusty window display, spring blooms in the slow blossoms, summer in cornflowers, fall in pink and lilac asters, and the feathery pom-poms of dandelions. A pale shop girl carries white roses out into the street with which she decorates a carriage parked outside. The flowers smell like old muslin. Flower alley. Or this afternoon at four, box seats five crowns. <clears throat> Let them spread the money among the people. Thousands profit indefinitely. You have no doubt it trickles down to, oh yeah, I forgot, I meant I want to dedicate this reading to the occupation of Wall Street now. It trickles down. Why? It's just impossible to think of it all the way through. One in the, out in the street, a young woman <clears throat> with a sleeping child in her arms states in state state stares at the flying bed of roses a slice of enchantment roses and horse-drawn carriage the mystery of the beautiful superfluous the child sleeps soundly in the clear morning air from a first floor window a young prostitute in her nightgown peeks out from behind a white shade should i hire the carriage should i not should I, should I not, should I? The shop girl looks up, you slut. The shop girl yawns, sticks a rose into the coachman's buttonhole. The child sleeps soundly in the clear morning air. The prostitute pulls down the shade. The rose carriage rolls off. The roses sway, bow, rustle, tremble in the breeze, and one tumbles to the asphalt. That afternoon, a woman and a young girl hire the carriage. <coughs> Les fleurs sont fausses, the girl observes. Is that so, says the mother? Is it really that obvious? Flower alley, a cross, access via the Patastrasse, flying flower bed, thousands profit indirectly. <coughs> the young prostitute lies in her bed asleep. The afternoon sun warms the white shade. She is dreaming rose carriage. The shop girl reclines on a little wicker chair in the dark, dank, artificial flower storeroom, asleep, she is dreaming, rose carriage. The young woman carries her child through the streets. The child sleeps soundly in the misty afternoon air. The rose that tumbled that morning from the passing carriage stands tall in a glass on a street sweeper's windowsill. His little daughter says, yuck, it stinks to which the street sweeper might have replied, these are the flowers that blossom on the asphalt in a big city. But that's not what he said. A simple man, it just wasn't his way. He muses, must be the flower alley. 
This is a guy who likes to write about children. Uh, his whole his whole life is obsessed in ways with children. There are sides of Altenburg that perhaps in modern times we probably wouldn't want to explore too closely. Like Lewis Carroll, he had a collection of uh, postcard photographs of uh, underage girls in different states of, uh, of clothing. Uh, I don't know for a fact if he ever actually acted on any of this. He was a man in some ways locked in his own childhood state. This is a piece called Poverty. Conversation <clears throat> with my 10-year-old dinner guest, Caroline B, the little daughter of a poor widow, perfection in the making, already a profoundly human creature. Tomorrow, sir, I have to travel far out to the doll doctor in the fifth district. Whatever for? Somebody gave me a doll. She only had a top half. Curious. Why curious? If she'd had a bottom half, too, they damn sure wouldn't have given her to me. And the folks got them. I'd like to have a blue balloon. A blue balloon is what I'd like. Here's a blue balloon for you, Rosamunde. It was explained to her then that there was a gas inside that was lighter than the air in the atmosphere, as a consequence of which, etc., etc. I'd like to let it go, she said, just like that. Wouldn't you rather give it to that poor little girl over there? No, I want to let it go. She let the balloon go, keeps looking after it till it disappears in the blue sky. Aren't you sorry now that you didn't give it to that poor little girl? Yes, I should have given it to the poor little girl. Here's another blue balloon. Give her the one, this one. No, I want to let this one go too, up into the blue sky. She does so. She is given a third blue balloon. She goes over to the poor little girl on her own, gives this one to her, saying, you let it go. No, says the poor little girl, peering in rapture at the balloon. In her room, it flew up to the ceiling, stayed there for three days, got darker, shriveled up, and fell down dead, a little black sack. Then the poor little girl thought to herself, I should have let it go outside in the park, up, up into the blue sky. I'd have kept on looking after it, kept on looking. In the meantime, the rich little girl gets another 10 balloons, and one time, Uncle Carl even buys her all 30 balloons in one batch. 20 of them she lets fly up into the sky and gives 10 to poor children. From then on, she absolutely has no interest in balloons. <clears throat> the stupid balloons, she said. Whereupon Aunt Ida observed that she was rather advanced for her age. The poor little girl dreamed, <clears throat> I should have let it go up into the blue sky. I'd have kept on looking and looking 